Good afternoon. I'm Mary Thoreau with the Independent Institute, and I'm delighted to get to spend the next hour with P.J. O'Rourke. Um, and we're going to talk about his latest book, A Cry from the Far Middle. P.J., it's really great to see you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for thank you for having me. Last time we were together was that uh, three years ago you emceed our 30th anniversary gala, which was just fabulous. Was that row three years ago? Gosh. Yeah, we were all dressed up at the Ritz with 500 yeah. people. I I really look forward to getting all dressed up and being with 500 people again. <laughs> me too. Me too. Of course, it depends on the 500. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it says that. So this is your 20th book. Is it truly? Yeah. Yeah, it is indeed. Fabulous. Well, as I mentioned before we came on, I just it's a delight and it's amazing that it's your twentieth because it's as fresh and full of insight and cleverness as if it were the first thing you'd ever done. Um, and just as I was saying, every page has a zinger on it. I love that you're the only person I know who could describe the free market as a martini. You say, competition is the vermouth and the martini, but as it is with martinis, so it is with free markets. For every one part competition vermouth, there are six parts of that top shelf gin called spontaneous cooperation among free people, which always seems to leave politicians shaken, not stirred. <laughs> so that's just a, a hint at the wittiness in this book. So let's get started. Let's start with the title. So um, you describe yourself as a libertarian. At one point, you say, I believe in individual freedom, individual dignity, and individual responsibility as long as I get to be an irresponsible, undignified freeloader, at least every so often. Yes. Do you think, do you think most people think of libertarianism as the middle? No, I, I don't. In fact, I think, unfortunately, libertarianism has become identified uh, to some degree with uh, with the with the right, uh, with conservatism, uh, or even with the alt right and all the nuthatch stuff that goes with that, which just couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, the the classic libertarian diagram, you know, show is 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 three dimensional. You know, it's there. It's not it's not just a line with a left and a right, with with, with people in the middle. There's also a a, 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 another axis. If I if I hadn't flunked math, I could tell you which axis that was: x, y, y, z, whatever it is. But there's a vertical axis too. A, a, a axis too, which is you, you, you can be rather to the left or rather to the right, and very in favor of individual liberty or very against it. There is a totalitarianism index, and libertarians are right at the top of the graph in the anti-totalitarian quadrant there. Um, uh, but, you know, some libertarians, um, <clears throat> many libertarians lean toward a conservative uh, political position, but not by all means uh, 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 every one of them. There, there, there are also, there are, are left-wing, left-ish at any rate, um, uh, uh, libertarians too, uh, you know, who, who, who do believe, you know, who d believe in the idea of redistribution, but but also believe in leaving people alone as much as possible. Well, moving right along to the subtitle, which is Dispatches from a Divided Land, um, but rather than sort of joining the rest of the world and bemoaning the fact that we're divided, uh, you say, first, let us be thankful that in our domestic politics, we are a bitterly divided nation. So why should we be thankful for that division? Well, there are, in, in a great big complex democracy in, 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 in a fully developed economy like ours, there are a lot of political questions to be argued and they need to be argued strenuously. Uh, they need to be argued repeatedly. They don't go just go away. Uh, we need to have discussion. We need to have two sides, three sides, four sides of arguing about these questions. Without the divisions that we have, if there were no argument, you know, uh, what would we be? You know, some sort of, uh, of strange sort of monolithic totalitarian society where everybody agreed, whether they agreed to agree or not, everybody would agree. Um, so no division and, and, and America started out as, as a sharply divided country 
Um, we we have never we're not unified by ethnic ties. We're not un, we're barely unified by language. Uh, we're not unified by religious belief. We're not unified by by blood and soil. You know, I, I mean, uh, people came here from all over the world. Now, some of them came here voluntarily. Uh, some of them, some 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 of our families came here as a sort of land scam. Some of our families were dragged here as uh, involuntarily uh, as slaves. Um, some people were driven here by religious bigotry. Some came here to establish a religious bigotry. Um, some were chased here by poverty. I mean, my own family, uh, we, 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 we escaped the, you know, we, we weren't going anywhere. We were getting out of someplace. We were leaving Ireland because of the famine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how exactly, because none of my, that part of my, that, that, that back then, no one in my family was literate. So we don't know exactly what happened. But apparently it was some sort of work gang thing where they were shipped across the Atlantic, the whole families, and went by wagon train across Canada to be lumberjacks in Michigan. And I have a feeling that my family, probably for the first couple of generations, didn't even know what country they were in. Yeah, right. You also point out that when we're united, it's generally because we're under a foreign threat. So we should be grateful that we're, we're not. not under a foreign <laughs> yeah, threat currently. Right. I mean, we are, of course. But so we have the luxury to to bicker among ourselves because we don't have to unite against. Right. One little Pearl Harbor, and all of a sudden, everybody's singing from the same page in the hymnal, you know. And that's, uh, let's yeah. not wish for that. I mean, exactly. It's, uh, it's nice that we all come together during a crisis, but let's not wish for the crisis that would bring us together. Absolutely. You also describe yourself as a policy wonk, who's all wonk and no policy. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about how you uh, came from being an English major from Ohio to being a political pundit? Well, it's just a matter of like looking for something funny to cover as a journalist. You know, I, I sort of, uh, I sort of picked writing first. Uh, I meant to be a writer. Uh, I meant to write incomprehensible modern novels and strange modern poetry that didn't rhyme or mean anything. But I found that I. Uh, had to eat. <laughs> and, uh, so I thought, well, you know, I've been reading all these years, you know, being an English major and stuff. So I must know how to write, which was not in fact the case. But at any rate, I managed to get like, you know, managed to squeak by with some journalism jobs. And as I undertook journalism as a, as a, <laughs> I'd hardly call it a profession, but as I undertook it in order to eat, I found that, um, that, 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 what I wrote often made people laugh, um, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not, but they laughed and, and, and I, I took the hint, you know, if enough people call you a horse's ass, saddle up and ride out of town. And so I've spent the, you know, 50 years now looking for funny things, to, looking for human folly um, because that's the fodder for humor. And uh, that's what I was doing. I spent 20 years as a foreign correspondent. I didn't go cover earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis and, and, and terrible things like that because those, they weren't the fault. They, they, the human, the human folly was not behind those things. Uh, I liked, you know, sort of wars and revolutions and, yeah. and, and, and civil uprisings, the stupider the better. Um, uh, where, where human folly was, was obviously and evidently in play. And being a little, you know, about the time of the, by the end of the uh, Iraq war, I realized that I was too, too, uh, too old to be scared stiff and too stiff to sleep on the ground. And it, maybe I should, I should take it home. Uh, and um, uh, so I've been covering politics and economics, two great fields of, of uh, human folly ever since. Well, I had been before uh, 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 also, but now it's pretty much my full-time job. Yeah, I think Holidays in Hell is the first of your books that I read, and I've been a massive fan ever since. Oh, well, thank you. Um, so Independent Institute publishes several books a year, so I'm pretty Indeed. familiar with the book publishing process and the lead time between writing a book and it's actually coming out. So here you've written a book about uh, the political situation in 2019, and you're what at the page proof stage, and 2020 happens. 
Yes. Yeah, the what book did you was, think? What the book was typeset. It was what went through my head was, oh, un, you know, uh, oh, something I can't say even on a Zoom. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, it, it was, uh, I mean, you know, first uh, uh, we had the, the COVID outbreak, you know, and that, of course, was just unsettled everything. And then um, the Minneapolis Police Department decides to take a knee on George Floyd's neck. And the poor guy, after however, however many long minutes it was of agony, you know, dies. And he, you know, and as I pointed out, I, th I think in the pre-preface that I had to quickly tack onto this book, I said, you know, his, his alleged crime, he was accused of, of using a $20 bill that had no actual value. Well, Congress is spending trillions of $20 bills that have no actual value. Uh, the Fed is, uh, the Treasury is, uh, the, the, and, and the Mint are just rolling this stuff out. You know, poor George Floyd, you know, if he'd been a politician, he'd be, well, if he'd been a politician, he probably wouldn't have gotten reelected because he was only trying to spend 20 bogus dollars <laughs> instead of 20 trillion bogus dollars. But anyway. Uh, so yes, the, the the whole political scene was 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 upset, um, and I, I think the result was in in the uh, after the book had been been printed and distributed um, <clears throat> in the 2020 election, I think the result was you know pretty much not the reverse of what it would be have been uh, without the, those those two events, but um, altered. I think that uh, um, Trump's, I don't want to say mishandling of the uh, pandemic, because um, it wasn't really that Trump was wrong, uh, because everybody, even Dr. Fauci, at one point or to one degree or another, was wrong um, uh, about COVID-19, um, sooner or later, to a less or lesser or greater uh, degree. Um, it's just that... that you know, the nature, the psychological nature of leadership is that we want our leaders to at least give the appearance of knowing what they're doing. And Trump just seemed as absolutely confused and ignorant about this as all the rest of us. And it, it, that may be fair enough. Maybe any president would have been as confused and ignorant, but you're not allowed to let it show. <laughs> so I think that probably got him unelected. But then again, on the other hand, the uh, defund the police movement and the turmoil and the looting and, 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 and the rioting uh, in America's cities, which was really, um, it wasn't as violent uh, as it had been in the 1960s, but it was more extensive. It came closer to people's homes, uh, uh, closer to more people's homes than, than, than any previous sort of civil disturbance in, in recent memory at any rate. And I think that is why, um, we will probably end up with a Republican um, Senate again and why the, the Democrats did not like sweep the table in the House and why they were unable to flip any of the state legislatures or, uh, um, uh, or you know, uh, increase their, their local influence in politics. You would have thought that in a year where, oh, I wouldn't say that they won big, but they, they won. Uh, and normally there's a coattail effect that, that, that simply um, um, Biden must have been wearing a very short coat. Yeah. Yeah, we'd like to remind people when they're advocating for passing a new law is that <clears throat> the ultimate uh, penalty for, for uh, breaking any law is death. And people don't seem to understand that, but the, you know, the enforcement of all law ends up being a gun and uh... very basic libertarian principle here. You know, the slightest, least little thing, a parking ticket um, is ultimately government's monopoly on deadly force ultimately enforces the least little regulation, the least little slip up you make on your taxes. And or like I say, a parking ticket, if you don't pay that parking ticket, uh, you're going to get fined. And if you don't pay that fine, uh, you're going to go to court and be fined more. Uh, you don't pay that fine, you're going to go to jail. You try to escape jail, they'll shoot you. 
Uh, you can get shot for parking on the wrong side of the street on the wrong day. Um, yeah. And again, with taxes, taxes are ultimately enforced by force. And, you know, I, I always ask people, when, when, when you want the government to do something, say, say this to yourself. Would I shoot my mother to get this done? Would I shoot my mother to pave I-95? No, you know, I, would, I would not. To win World War II? Oh, sorry, mom. <laughs> I mean, maybe, you know, but, but to pave I-95? No, no, no. A good litmus test. Yes, it's the gun at your mother's head. There's a gun at your mother's head every time the government spends a penny. And, um, you know, so it's, it, it, just, keep that, just keep that in mind when you want the government to do this or the government to do that or the government to do the other thing. Yeah, very true. Um, I found it very refreshing because for the past 10 years, of course, we've just heard this litany of the millennials are socialists, we're doomed, millennials are socialists, we're doomed, and so on. Um, yet, you don't seem to share that despair of the next generation and have a, quite a good chapter on it called Why Kids Are Commies. Uh, would you yeah, care I've got to three of them. I've got three of them. <laughs> They're terrible little leninists. So, so why are kids commies? Well, you know, what set me thinking about this was, of course, I was a commie too once, you know. I mean, I, I too was a kid. I was a child of the 60s. And not only did I experience the 60s, but in my own small personal way, I did everything I could to cause the 60s. And, uh, and I started thinking, well, what is it, you know? And then, of course, there's that old Churchill quote that, a, you know, a man at 20 who's not a, a left, a, not a socialist, that has no heart, and a man of 40 who, who isn't a conservative, has no brain, et cetera. So obviously this is, and that's from, you know, almost 100 years ago that he said that. And I'm, so I realized that, okay, at the core of the Marxist idea, I shouldn't even say Marxist because Karl Marx actually stole this idea from some French socialist um, who had already been around. But the, but the idea is from each according to his ability to each according to his need, which is such a sweet idea. It really is a nice idea, except what's my ability? My ability is to make an occasional wisecrack, um, uh, uh, the odd pun, this, that, things like that. And my need is for a hundred foot yacht, a chateau in France, you know, a ski house in Aspen. Uh, really, there's no limit to my need. So you can see why real life doesn't actually work out on the from each according to his ability to each according to his need sort, <clears throat> sort of idea. However, that said, there is one place where from each according to his ability to each according to his need, actually happens and actually works. And it's called the family. When you're a little kid, it really is. I mean, mom and dad work, you know, you fool around and you know, spill food, food on the floor and make a mess. And it's from each according to his ability to each according to his need. They, you know, they, 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 they feed you, you, you look cute occasionally. Uh, whatever it is, you know, that whatever benefit it is we get from having kids, you know, I sometimes remember and sometimes forget, <laughs> depending on how the kid is acting. So kids, when they get to that stage where they're just getting past being kids, and mom and dad are starting to say, <clears throat> I think maybe it's time you moved out of the basement, you know, or, <clears throat> you know, maybe you should look for a job or something like that. Uh, when, when kids are just at that stage, where you know many of the millennials and whatever they call the next generation after that, where, where they are, Gen Z, yeah, Gen Z. Um, that's when they like go through. The, they rebel against. Essentially, they're rebelling against growing up. They're saying, "No, no, it's from each according to his ability to each according to his need." And mom and dad failing them. Um, maybe the government will be their mommy. Um, it's a natural stage for for young people to go to. And plus, you know, they're they're idealistic, you know, I mean, they, 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 they're, they're just getting old enough to realize that the world is a very unfair place and a lot of bad things happen in the world. And, you know, we older people take that, of course, you know, we, we've known that for a long time. We've learned to live with it, um, change what you can change, live with what you can't and so on and so forth. But they're not there yet. They're still really upset. Of course, they don't have any money. So they want to fix all this injustice with our money. Um, they don't have any power yet, so they want us to fix it with our power. 
Uh, they're very busy being kids. You know, I mean, kid, being a kid is very time consuming. There's all that dating and stuff and uh, occasional studying in college and, and so forth. And so they want our time and effort to go into, uh, they want us to fix this all. And so it's just a natural stage that they're going through and they'll get over it. I'm not, I know exactly how they'll get over it because I remember how I got over it. I got a job. And it wasn't the job that got me over it. I hated the job. Of course, I hated the capitalist corporation that I worked for. And in fairness, they were paying me 75 bucks a week. So I had every right to hate them. And, um, and they paid me every two weeks. And so I, I get this job and I, in two weeks, I'm going to get paid. And I'm really looking forward to that 150 bucks. And so is my landlord. And uh, uh, I get my first paycheck. And I, after federal taxes, state taxes, city taxes, uh, uh, health plan contribution, retirement plan contribution, union dues, I net out at like $86.40. And I go, wait a minute, I'm a communist. You know, I, 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 I've demonstrated for communism. I, 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 I rioted for communism. I vandalized for communism. I'm a communist. And I go to, finally, I go to work for a big capitalist corporation and I get my first paycheck and I discover we've got communism already. They just took half my money. I'm not Rockefeller. You know, it snapped me right, right, wide awake. Yeah. So at Independent, when we saw uh, the disillusionment among this generation with, you know, they millennials uh, overwhelmingly voted for Obama in 2008 because, of course, you know, peace, hope, change. Who wouldn't? Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. And then he got into office and there wasn't any peace and no hope and no change. Um, and so they turned away from Obama and in 2012, they either didn't vote for him or they didn't vote at all. Yeah. And we saw this kind of happening, but they weren't you know, becoming conservatives by any, or libertarians by any means. They were sort of adrift, like looking for, well, now what do I latch into? So we started this, as you, know that satire works extremely well, um, started a satirical video series called Love Gov, <laughs> which was aimed at um, what we saw as the so-called movable middle, the people who are neither haven't yet settled on the far left or on the far right. And we started digging deeper. We're going, well, okay, so exactly who is movable and when are they movable? And that came up with the same thing. Um, it's called early careerists. So they're getting their first job, their first apartment, da da. And reality is coming smack dab up against yeah, yeah. theory. And it's yeah. like, ah, holy cow. <laughs> yeah. Gov, Gov is not here to help me. Yeah. Um, so it's been widely, widely popular. Yeah, I, I, I know it has. And I and it's just exactly the right, right approach to take. And it's, you know, I mean, it's not um, uh, a lot of uh, especially conservatives, I'd say, but there's some libertarians out there too that are that are angry with young people, essentially for being young. You know, yeah. and it's like, you know, are they wrong about things? Like we grown ups <laughs> aren't wrong about things. You know, are they wrong about things? But I mean, they've only been here. They only just got here. You know, I mean, uh, you know, and and like, and usually, in my experience, they're. When, when, when I, especially judging from my own children, when I, when I, I disagree with, with their opinions, the, the opinions they have that I disagree with, they don't have them out of malice. They're, they're, not, they're not opinions full of hate. Uh, they're not opinions wishing for a worse world. Um, it's, all, it's all very well-meaning. And of course, we, you know, it, it takes a little while to discover in life what the road to hell is paved with. You know? So, but you know, but the, their intentions are good. Yeah, and I think you're right that they they usually come out of it. Um, I really enjoyed the uh, you're teaching your daughter the fairness precept. <laughs> Said one day when she was about eight or nine and had worked herself into a huge snit about the unfairness of something or another, I lost my patience and snapped at you. Not fair, I said. You're cute. That's not fair. Your parents are pretty well off. That's not fair. You were born in America. That's not fair. Honey, you better get down on your knees and pray to God that things don't start getting fair for you. 
<laughs> it didn't, of course, quite work. I still, she's, you know, she's, uh, what is she? She's just about to turn 23, and I still have to remind her of that every <laughs> every now and then. Yeah, it's be glad there's not justice, is what we, as we say. <laughs> yeah. We, we all think we deserve all these. Yeah, nobody would, would want to face perfect justice. Yeah. I should probably ask you a couple of the questions from the audience and not hog you all to myself, but well, hog away. I'll come back. We have from Mike Farr. Well, you deal with this. Uh, actually, I thought this was really fascinating because you you point out that who was it um, in your chapter and whose bright idea was it to make sure that every idiot in the world was in touch with every other idiot. Um, you cite the media theory philosopher Marshall McLuhan, who is best known for saying the medium is the message, um, as seeing that the web 30 years before its creation was going to create an, un an unfriendly global village. He said, when people get close together, they get more savage and impatient with each other, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which was a great insight. And it's, it's, it's playing out all day, every day on, on Facebook and everything else. We've all been through family dinners like that. You know, I mean, you know, we've, we've all got the relatives we really love, but then we've got the occasions where we have to invite all the relatives. Everybody's been at that drunken rehearsal dinner at the wedding <laughs> where there's the one uncle that won't shut up, you know, about what the groom was up to when, <laughs> never mind. Uh, the uh, um, who, who's that question from? Was that Michael? So Mike Farr? Farr is asking if it's if social media is inherently tribal and inflammatory. If yes, does it drown out and replace cooperative discussions? If yes, will we face eliminating or seriously modifying it to keep it from ripping civil society apart? Is its social value ultimately negative? Yeah. <laughs> to all of that. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> I, I just wondered if that's, I have a very close friend named Michael Farr. I just wondered if that was the same one. If that, uh, if that came in from Fort Myers, Florida, that would be my friend, Michael Farr. But anyway, yeah, yeah, it is very destructive. Uh, human communication has the potential to be very destructive. And what we have to do is like get used to it, tame it, uh, settle down uh, and, um, um, uh, build social norms around it, and this can take a long time. And the example that I give here is that um, when printing was invented, what basically when printing was invented, what happened was the Bible got printed. And once people were actually able to read the Bible, as opposed to just listening to priests talk about the Bible, they began to realize that they had severe disagreements, sometimes with the Bible, always with each other, often with the church. So the one the immediate effects of the invention of movable type, one of the great inventions of all time, was the 30 years war uh, between Protestants and Catholics that tore Europe apart, the most devastating uh, 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 war in the history of Europe up until, probably up until the Second World War, probably, probably did worse devastation e even than the First World War. Um, new forms of communication can be highly destructive. And, you know, it may take 30 years, it may take a 30 years war for, for, for the internet to, uh, looping back to Marshall McLuhan, uh, McLuhan had this message, you know, it, it was all about television back then because computers weren't really a factor yet. It was all about television was going to create a global village. And and I, I remember back in the 60s, all my friends and I were going, oh, a global village. How cool is that? You know, we'll all be a global village. And, and, and there was this idea current at the time uh, 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 that, oh, communication was so important. You know, if only kids and their parents could communicate, we could close the generation gap. If only Republicans and Democrats could communicate, we could close the partisan gap. If only blacks and whites could communicate, you know, the civil rights struggle would be over. If only America and the USSR could c communicate, you know, the Cold War would be solved. And that was what we thought Marshall McLuhan was saying, but we hadn't bothered to read him. And so I went out and did so, and he was actually extremely gloomy about this for just the reasons yeah. that you mentioned. When people, I mean, imagine a world where you can hear exactly what everybody thinks. 
what relationship would what relationship what marriage what 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 parenthood what 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 business partnership could endure hearing exactly what the other person thinks all the time mm -hmm. uh, which is what we're doing on the internet right now and marshall McLuhan, so i, I tracked it down and i found a great television inter uh, radio radio interview with him in ontario canada and a radio interviewer says well dr McLuhan." you said that television was going to create a, a global village. And, and McLuhan goes, I never said the villagers would like each other. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, uh, uh, I, I, I am depressed by the way social media works. When you, it used to be if you were a nut, you had to go get a mimeograph machine, get your hands covered with mimeograph ink, you know, punch out the mimeograph stencils and run off your crazy leaflets and stand on a street corner and hand them out and stand on a soapbox and yell at people and carry a sign and stuff. It was a lot of work being a crank. Now, one click of a finger, you know, and no matter how wrong you are about any issue, you can find this whole enthusiastic group of people that are even wronger you know, and you can all get together and be wrong together in a matter of milliseconds. Uh, it's not doing us any good. We'll get over it, but, you know, maybe not in my lifetime. You point out that this, uh, this tendency to beat up on each other is nothing new. You talk about the Paleo-Americans looking at the skeletal remains. More than half of the men have injuries caused by violence, and four out of ten have skull fa fractures. Um, the wounds don't appear to have been the result of hunting mishaps, but they don't, and they don't bear telltale signs of warfare. Instead, it appears that these men fought among themselves, often and violently. That brought to mind I, there was a story. That was from National Geographic. You yeah, know? this was not like this was not like some nutty, nutty right wing theory about human nature. You know, this was this was an article about ancient Paleo-American remains in National Geographic. I'm sure they got a lot of hate mail for that because there are a lot of people out there who believe deep down inside humans are good. I'm not one of them. Uh, there was a really, it brought to mind, there was a really funny, well, not funny. There was an article in the um, San Francisco Chronicle a few years ago um, talking, and it was headlined, Early Life of Harmony, First Indian inhabitants lived in harmony by the bay. But you'd get into the article and it talked about uh, an academic paper noted that almost one fifth of the skeletons found had, had healed fractures and penetration wounds. <laughs> and, and, and they're all just terribly beat up. And it turns out that the harmony that the headline was talking about was well, they didn't do much damage to the environment because they were living at subsistence level. <laughs> <laughs> but they're a terrible well, discord with each other. Thank goodness so. for that. Yeah, yeah. The trees were fine. The bears <laughs> were fine. The people were fighting with each other, They're just like they always, they always have been. That's yeah. an interesting. You know, there's an interesting divide within libertarianism too. Is uh, uh, that kind of reflects that? I think that it's a wiser and more pessimistic view in general to assume, you know, what what Christians uh, and one of which I am myself. Um, uh, call original sin, that people do have a bad side that's inherent in them. They have good inherent in them too, but they, but, but they, they have the capacity for evil. Um, the, a similar divide, there's a similar divide in, in libertarian ideology, which is that some libertarians believe, peop that believe people are invariably rational. And as uh, 20 years of, of war correspondence work, I would beg to differ on that. I mean, I think rationalism is extremely important and it's a real foundation of libertarianism that man has the capacity to be ra rational. Human beings have the capacity to be rational and that capacity should be fostered. But to believe that we're always rational is irrational. Yeah, and to overlook that we're all capable of evil is Right. The first Dangerous. Rule of why you don't give why you don't give anybody power. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's why, it's why you, you know, I, I often say to my leftist friends, and I do have leftist friends, to, you know, be careful of building. I mean, do you learn no lesson from Trump whatsoever? Be careful of building a gigantic government. Some lunatic may get a hold of it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Go, yeah. Not everybody would think that starting a, a book about the current 
21st century political system should start with the Roanoke colony, but apparently you do. So. Yeah, I, I did. Well, I, you know, I, I, well, I didn't mean to, but I started thinking about this. I said, you know, how long, how far back does this basic divide, divisiveness in America, how far back does it go? And the answer is all the way. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of history in this. Okay, I've got another question from Berkeley Tiger. Berkeley Tiger. Okay. Berkeley Let's, Tiger. I, I want to hope that that is Berkeley Tiger's real name. That is, <laughs> his last name's actually his or, or her. It might be a her. Too. I mean, yeah. that person. Berkeley last Tiger, name is send Tiger. us your driver's license. We want to see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Asks, how come those who want to, quote, bring all sides together usually seem to really mean that their liberal relativist views are correct and everybody else is wrong? Instead of saying honestly, quote, I think my view is true and your view mistaken, and then discuss the reasons in support of their opposed views. Yeah, well, that's basically the question my book asks. And if I had the answer, you know, Berkeley, I would be, I don't know what, president of the United States or something. I, I'm old enough. Maybe I'm not quite old enough. I'm only 73, <laughs> so maybe I'm not quite, but I'll soon be old enough to be president. Uh, no, that, that is, yes, the bring bring everybody together and hug and sing kumbaya. That's not really what I'm talking about here with a, a cry from the far middle. I want us to get out there. I want us to put our megaphones down and argue, but I want us to argue. I mean, I want us to argue, you know, using like premises, using evidence, you know, using logic. I, I want us to fight these things out. Uh, for all I know, you know, I, I, I might be convinced by, I mean, you always have to go into a political argument with a certain side of you that says, you know, I, I'll, I'm gonna listen to you. You, you, you may have a point. Um, I'm very much in favor of charter schools, very much in favor of private schools. And, you know, I'm very much in favor of our spending our educational money um, so that parents and, 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 and kids get to decide themselves, you know, uh, 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 how, that, how that money should be spent and where they should be educated and so on and so forth. But, but I was talking, I have a friend who strongly disagrees with me, who's a public school teacher. And he said, the problem with that idea, he said, I agree. You know, I've got a lot of kids who would really benefit from charter schools, who would benefit from private schools. Um, and I wish I could do more for them. He said the danger with those programs is they end up making the residual public schools would simply be dumping grounds for kids who had behavior problems or who had learning problems or had disabilities that no private school or charter school wants to cope with. And it's a very good point. It's a very strong point, a point that, that, that those who are in favor of um, of educational liberty need to address. They need to say, okay, what what do we do about these kids who are really hard cases? There are some kids out there. Ask any public school teacher. There are some bad kids out there, and of course, there are some kids. It's not their fault, you know. But I mean, there there are kids who have serious problems, and then there are kids who have whose serious problems are their parents, or more often, parent, you know or parent replacement, grandparent, or whoever's looking after them or not looking after them. Um, and so, you know, those things have to be addressed if we're going to do any sort of major educational reform. We can't just ignore that, that point that, that my school teacher friend brought up. Yeah, you don't, but <clears throat> that's the great thing about a market is it, it fills every need and there are special these specialized schools that do deal with that. Interestingly yeah. enough, this is something with which I have personal, um, in 1980, after her own children were all grown and out of the house, my mother had been very involved in starting the school that we all went to. Um, and it had started out as kind of a small do-it-yourself school. Over the years, it became successful and elite and expensive. So she saw a need for another school in the community um, that would be less exp more accessible and less expensive and started a school um, in 1980 and just on a shoestring they had she painted plywood with blackboard paint for the blackboards and things like that um, and initially the only students that she could attract were problem kids that nobody else wanted um, and that's what she started with and over the years you know now it's 
the highest ranked school in the state and so That's on. That's great. But, um, yeah. No, but it, there, you know, there, the cool. market, the market fills every need we've seen it time and time again. So yeah, I'm, did you know that the, I, it, we, I won't go off on this tangent too long, but the guy who did, did you ever see the movie Waiting for Superman about? Um, yes. Yes. Fantastic movie. Yeah. So he's the same guy who produced An Inconvenient Truth. Mm -hmm. So he was, you know, dyed in the wool. Uh, liberal, yeah. Credentialed liberal, but he, yeah. he said, you know, every day he realizes he's driving his children to their private school. He passed two public schools on the way, and it kind of went, wait a minute, I believe in public schools. Why am I passing public schools to get my kids to private schools? And that's when he... That's when he decided to make uh, look into it and made Waiting for Superman, which is a terrific, terrific uh, documentary that holds up well. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I think that you know that there's a there's a uh, uh, there's an answer. I didn't have it. I didn't have the expertise to give the right answer to my school teacher friend, but my instinct was there is an answer, and one of the reasons for that is Catholic schools. Catholic schools have always taken all Catholic children, regardless mm -hmm. of their ability, regardless of their behavior problems. I mean, you can get thrown out of Catholic school, but then you can get thrown out of public school, too, and wind up in juvenile detention. But I mean, it's it's basically as hard, or at least, you know, and where I grew up uh, with a very large Catholic population and a very large Catholic school system, if you went to the um, regular Catholic schools, it was essentially as hard to get tossed out of them as it was as it was to get tossed out of the public schools. You had to do something really pretty atrocious. Um, you were not as likely to do something quite as atrocious because the Catholic schools still believed in corporal punishment in those days, which the public schools had pretty much abandoned. So instead of standing in a corner, you got some really raw knuckles from the nun. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. Whatever works. Exactly. Um, so on Independence website, we have a, a really interesting writer named Angela Cotevilla. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but um, he talks. It. He's talked about, in fact, writing in ten years ago, the ruling party versus the country party, and explaining this divide of, and pointed out that we've been uh, they've been electing people outsiders uh, for years. That people are tired of being ruled by these elites who think they know everything and and the dumb idiots and the so you you pose it as the uh coast the let's see the heartlanders versus the coastals exactly yeah and not the, not that all the coastals are on the coast of course they're spread in a sort of of a gulag archipelago <laughs> across the united states in every big city and every little college town but yes, the, uh, one of the things that the book is fundamentally about is this divide between um, the, 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 the way that a certain kind of elite American, often very well educated, often quite intelligent, often quite, quite successful, looks down his or her nose at the rest of Americans. And it's basically the way I described it was you've got a group of people who know all about um, GMO free and whether something is vegan and whether it's been fair traded and whether, you know, the, the, the animals involved were, 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 were free, it was, you know, it's free run chickens, you know, eggs only from, uh, and so on and so forth, but they don't know hay from straw. And I said, you know, and this, this ends up being bad for both sides of this argument. I mean, it, it leaves the elites trying to sip their Starbucks lattes through a blade of hay, but it also leaves people in the, in the heartland to stuff a scarecrow full of straw and put it in the White House, you know, I mean, it leads to real anger and bitterness. And we need a little better understanding. And I, I think the onus of this particularly falls on elites who have just, you know, so divorced themselves from the from 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 the ordinary part of life. There's a great moment in that Clint Eastwood, um, Clint, a recent, relatively recent Clint Eastwood movie. Um, what was it called? The The Mule, about an older man mm -hmm. who ends up running drugs because basically yeah. because he's never been stopped by the police. He's never had a speeding. He's never had a traffic ticket in his entire life, and always drives exactly at the speed limit. Plus, he's this old guy in an old pickup, and he's a perfect drug mule. So he ends up. Uh, 
And, and there's this one scene in there where he's driving by and there's a young couple at the side of the road and um, with their kid. And the young man is standing up on the berm on the side of the road, pointing his iPhone up into the sky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Clint Eastwood pulls over and he says, what's the matter? And they said, we have a flat tire. He said, well, what's your husband doing? And he said, he's trying to get a YouTube on how to change a tire. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, that's my children to get a YouTube and how to change a tire, you know. And, you know, that was a perfect example of the uh, of that divide in America um, that uh, we need to get over. Yeah. The problem with, and you were talking about having, you know, being able to have conversations, and that's a real challenge now, especially, is because the best way to have conversations is face to face. Yeah, well, yeah, this, now that we're not allowed to be face to face, yeah, that lets it, this year out, doesn't kind it? Kind of yeah. fueling the fire. Yeah. So you, you do include a very helpful quiz um, in case any of your readers are unsure whether they're a coastal or a heartlander. They can take the quiz and 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 find out once and for all, which yes, would be, yes. would be very helpful. Yeah. And the answer at, at the end is, you know, you can tote up the number of things, you know, differences that I check off, you know, I mean, do, 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 do you go to yoga class or church, you know, I mean, it did that kind of thing. Um, but um, uh, at the end, it, it, it says, um, uh, uh, if you think books with personal quizzes in them are stupid, you're a heartlander. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Absolutely. So we've got another question. Marcus in the East Bay. Marcus, okay. Do you think that libertarianism, oops, it just went away. Do you think that libertarianism is ever wrong about anything? <laughs> Sometimes libertarians seem doctrinaire and almost theological about their views. That's the truth, that's the truth. There is a sort of strain of libertarian um, that, that certainly can do that. Uh, but in yet I would still, I would answer Marcus, no. Because libertarianism is not an ideology per se, it's really an analytical tool. And it's based on three questions. And, there are, <clears throat> and, and the three questions are based on three principles. And three principles are human individual liberty, individual liberty, individual dignity, and individual responsibility. And the three questions are, whenever you face a, particularly a political or governmental issue, how does this affect individual liberty? How does it affect individual dignity? And how does it affect individual responsibility? And um, so, you know, asking those three questions can never be wrong. You can come up with wrong answers to them. There's no doubt about that. And, and, and there's no doubt that there are libertarians out there whom I would say, do come up with wrong answers uh, 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 to, 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 to their inquiries or didactic answers. Or, you know, I myself, I'm, I'm one of those libertarians who can't bear Ayn Rand. I mean, I just, I can't, I mean, the literary, <laughs> I can't handle the literary style. I can't handle the way that she makes a point and then won't lead it alone. You know, the way she beats a live horse. Um, I, I, I can't, uh, I don't like her atheism. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not, an, an, I, and yet, you know, many of my libertarian friends, you know, can consider, you know, somebody who hasn't read Ayn Rand to be, you know, just intellectually derelict. You know? Yeah, it's interesting because I, I grew up very much uh, in a very classical liberal household um, and thought that everybody thought this way. And I'd never even heard of Ayn Rand until I got to college. So, um, but I, you know, I'm grateful to her because she does bring these ideas to a lot of people who otherwise haven't been exposed to them, so. Well, she does, she does. Now, now my wife um, read, um, <clears throat> which, is, which is the one where, where all the all the yeah smart. you talked about when you went to Russia yeah. Atlas shrugged long trip Atlas big book. shrug yeah so my wife just on the theory of long trip long book so we took the Trans Siberian Express we didn't take the whole darn thing all the way from Moscow but we took we flew out to Irkutsk and we took the Trans Siberian Railroad from Irkutsk to Vladivostok now if you look at the map of Russia you think oh you're in Irkutsk it's Lake Baikal now oh, you're practically there. 
<laughs> wrong. It is four days and five nights by train from Irkutsk to Vladivostok. Wow. So my wife brings the brings along Atlas Shrugged, and she keeps looking out the window at this guy. You, got, you know, I mean, Russia is beautiful. That part of Siberia is absolutely beautiful. But when you get to a town, it is just godforsaken. You know, it's like here you are in one of the most beautiful places in the world. It looks like the Pacific Northwest or like, like the, the, the more habitable parts of Alaska. And I mean, you look at it like you'll see a thousand acres of wild irises. I mean, it's just incredible. And along the Mongolian border, it looks like a, a par one million golf course. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just fabulous. And yet you come to the town and there are these stinky prefab concrete buildings, you know, and everything's a mess and, you know, and whatever, I mean, this is post USSR, but whatever market reforms ever did come to Russia, certainly it, the news had not reached Siberia. And so my wife keeps looking down at Atlas Shrugged and keeps looking out the window and she says, so that's what happened to this country. And I said, yeah, in a nutshell, yes, absolutely. We had a really stark uh, contrast. Uh, Dave and I took a Baltic cruise years ago. It was not, not long after the fall of the Berlin mm -hmm. Wall. And you, from the Baltic to St. Petersburg, you go up this long, Yes, estuary, yeah, yeah. and passing all these rusted out cranes and abandoned ships, and just uh, it just looked like a, a junkyard, junkyard yeah. for an hour as you're yeah. approaching this beautiful city. Yeah, and from there we went to Estonia, and of course Estonia had been a, Russia, a, a Soviet satellite. So you pull into the port in in Tallinn, and, and it's the exact same cranes built by the Russians, but they're freshly painted. <laughs> they're working. And they're, they're working really hard because <laughs> right. Estonia, of course, immediately threw off all. Yes. Uh, you know, you know, the story that the, yeah. the president had been, it was a history, a 32 year old history teacher or something. Yeah. And all he knew was he'd read free to choose. And he said, okay, that's going to be our policy. And they just eliminated <laughs> everything. And the kind, I mean, it was just, it was the most vibrant, exciting place to be, and they were rediscovering their cultural heritage and and song and costume and and the economy was booming, and it was just like b black and white, yeah, just so amazing. stark. I remember well. I remember that exact feeling from the old days back before the fall of the Berlin Wall. As an American, I could go to East Berlin. Oh yeah. A German couldn't, but but an American because we were an occupying power. And theoretically, <clears throat> Berlin was still unoccupied. So I would go through check, Checkpoint Charlie, uh, which I did a number of times. And it truly was like going from from um, uh, from Technicolor to black and white. Yeah. I mean, when you, the minute you walk through the... Uh, ugh. And then you had to change a certain amount of German money. You had to turn your perfectly good German marks in for perfectly worthless East German marks. And, I, and it was only about like, 20 marks, you know, I don't know what the exchange rate was back in those days. Let's just call it $10. Uh, so I had $10 worth of Eastern. I couldn't spend it. I could not find anything to oh. spend. And I came back to go the other way through Checkpoint Charlie and the East German guards were all upset because I, I had East German money. You're not allowed to take it out of the country. Why? Who knows? This is worth nothing. And uh, they, they, you know, they 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 said, you, you you know why why you have why you have East German marks? And I said, oh well, I'm coming back tomorrow. <laughs> and one of Good them answer. Looks, you know, one of them looks at me and he said, why? <laughs> <laughs> well, that sums it up. But nonetheless, they let me keep my ten. So the next day, I had twenty dollars worth of East German money. I didn't know what to do with. You know, and I, I finally gave it to. I was finally able to, they shoo off most of the panhandlers, but of course there's always a few. So I just gave it to somebody on the street. <laughs> His lucky day. Yeah. You see, you couldn't probably find anything to spend it on either. <laughs> the other quiz you include in the book is, well, it's not a quiz. It's a, a licensing test for politicians, which I, I thought was just a brilliant idea. Do you have an answer key for this test, by the way? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, I was like upset by the idea. I checked in the District of Columbia. District of Columbia has close to 500 different professions that require some sort of licensing or board approval or something, ranging from brain surgeons to 
somebody who does your nails or braids your hair. There are like yeah. 500 different occupations that require some kind of license in the District of Columbia. But the people with the finger on the button who could blow up the entire world and while they're at it, spend trillions of our dollars, are they licensed? No, and I just thought that was terribly unfair. But then when it came down to trying to figure out what it is you would, how, how you'd pick out a politician, how you would, what skills they required, um, <laughs> Yes, it was, it, was, it was difficult to figure out how to board certify a politician. Yeah, I think that the essay questions say nothing of substance in 5,000 words or more. Extra credit for saying less at greater length. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a def, define the, define the uh, terminology, gerrymander, <laughs> log rolling, and the, and the true and false uh, section. It's, it's, uh, yes, there is no true. It's not a concept in politics. <laughs> Oh yeah, so it's a, sorry. It's false. a false, a false and false. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, and ending up with, if, if I recall right, ending up with my, uh, my, my, my wife and my family are one hundred percent behind me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. False or false? Yeah. yeah, that's really great. Uh, we're coming to the end. I'm going to see if we have any more questions. Luke I forty six fifty five. Probably not his or probably her not name. his given name. Yeah. I recently exposed a young person to an episode of Firing Line, and she was amazed at how deep the debate went and how professional it remained, even though it was clear that the participants held their positions very strongly. Do you have any thoughts about how we can restore the former culture of civil debate? Mary, I think we're doing our best right here. <laughs> you know, I, I, turn it over to me and Mary, and we will take care of it. But that's that's funny. Right. it's funny that that, 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 that that question should come up because I just got an email from an old friend of mine in San Francisco, uh, uh, my friend Tim, and Tim and I are sort of on the, on not, we're not political opposites, but Tim is a good deal more liberal than I am. And Tim was saying he had just come across an old episode of Firing Line, and there was a young Christopher Hitchens and William F. Buckley, and what they were arguing about was which of them had an undistributed middle principle in their logical syllogism. You said, you don't see that on TV anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Not a whole lot. Yeah. Well, as I alluded to earlier, I mean, if you get in, if you get in small groups, I mean, like we live in a neighborhood that is extremely representative of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, in all its views. And um, several years ago, I formed a neighborhood watch group and mm -hmm. everybody came because we were having some problems in the neighborhood, so common interest. And <clears throat> we do not agree on anything politically, but when it comes to coming together to solve common problems, we work together beautifully and harmoniously and uh, work out solutions to things. So it's just, you know, all politics is or should be local. Yeah. Yeah. It's often, I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, the, you, you certainly, you have arguments, but, um, but there, you have to live with these people. So that it rarely gets out of control. People at the zoning board rarely throw throw things at each other, you know, and we had very much the same experience. We sent all three of our kids to um, sort of Montessori type little private school out in the country um, which we were a little worried about, seemed a little on the hippy dippy side. They called their teachers by their first name and stuff like that. And um, it, no, actually it turned out that the parents and the teachers and, the, and indeed the kids um, concentrating as they were, they, they had a good, very good solid core curriculum program and uh, everything, everything worked out pretty well. Not perfectly, of course, you know, I mean, humans being humans, but uh, um, but but no, everybody got along very well, and they they knew perfectly well that I, I did not belong to their political ilk. Um, but it never came up, really. You know, it never never. It, actually, one time, one time, there was a teacher who was asked this, like in sixth grade, was asked what by a student, what are the what's the difference between Democrats and Republicans, and she said Democrats care about people. <laughs> <laughs> and the kid took this answer home and I, I, I heard it from my kid too, who was in the same class. So I'm about to blow my top, but, but some, but another parent beat me to it, marched over to that school and that teacher was called on the carpet and boy, got, got her ears pinned back mm. you know, by, not by the parent, but by the, uh, 
by the head of, head of the school who was herself quite politically liberal. Yeah. Um, so she, that's just not the kind of thing, you know. But the, the parent was very good. She says, you care about the people. You don't care about actual people. You care about the people. Yeah, yeah. and the and the farther yeah. the farther away the people are, the, the more, more you, you care, care about, about them. Exactly. <laughs> don't let them in here. No. <laughs> well, PJ, we're at an hour, which is what we committed to. It's just been a delight. And again, oh, I thanks, can't Frank. recommend your book, all of your books. Go out and buy all twenty of PJ's books. Oh, please do. <laughs> you will. Be, you will be entertained, and it's a wonderful uh, anecdote to if you're feeling. Uh, depressed by <laughs> anything currently going on, who could and be? And who isn't? <laughs> or, or need a little cheering up, this is good medicine. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mary. Thanks for joining us. Take care. All the best to Tina and your family.